It glows. It pulses. It beats to the rhythm of the heart. Usually we connect neon with pure commercialism, but Lily Lackish, a neon artist based in Los Angeles, has taken neon, the symbol of the American spirit, to a higher level of expression. Neon has a very bad reputation in our, in our society, really, but uh, I feel it's one of the most uh, beautiful, beautiful elements. It uh, lights up a, an environment and it makes you feel wonderful. For more than 30 years, Lily Lakish's great passion has been neon, but it has not been an easy love. The established art world didn't accept neon as art, but to Lily it lighted up a fire that has never died. I feel that uh, I'm some sort of uh, conduit for this work. It is drawing with light. And I feel that uh, I discovered this. It was something that opened up, you know, a world of, of uh, possibilities for me. It was like I had discovered the secret to the universe. Being out as a lesbian and turning her insides out has contributed to her remarkable career in the art world, a world that first looked at Lily's neon sculptures with disdainful eyes. I uh, started drawing little little designs and uh, you know s took them to this place, had them made into neon, and then incorporated uh, incorporated those pieces into into my work. Well, of course, my teachers at Pratt Institute said, "Well, you know, we need to put you in advertising. <laughs> this isn't fine art. <laughs> you need to transfer into the advertising department." Well, I said, "No." You know, I'd just rather finish, and I did manage to graduate, although it was not a pleasant experience. It's been a struggle to be accepted as a fine artist in general, but Lily's great strength against rejection was her honesty and her will to succeed. Well, I have been uh, gay my entire life. I've been a lesbian my entire life. Um, and so, it just seemed that I really couldn't separate that from, um, from any part of my life, and certainly not from uh, uh, the part of my life that was the most important, which was, uh, which was my art. It's certainly been a, you know, difficult at times and, and a struggle at times because certainly you don't get much support um, in straight society for being gay, but uh, it's also something that, uh, you know, that I can't... Uh, that I can't shut down, that I can't deny. It's, it's who I am. Something she said to me a few years ago was, be true to your art and your art will be true to you. And that's one thing that she has done. She has a deep conviction towards her work and her convictions in life are deep commitments to speaking up for fairness, human dignity, and also the suffering and loss that we experience in life. This is called Requiem, and it's a uh, Christ figure. But it's also a portrait of my um, longtime uh, companion, Mary Carter. So it's actually a portrait of her face as, uh, as a Christ figure. The crown of thorns is made out of uh, some copper tubing kind that connects a water heater to the uh, gas line. Lily also made a down-to-earth version of her lover of 14 years. I made her into the shape of a heart, and I call it sweetheart. <laughs> this uh, piece right here is uh, probably every uh, gay woman's fantasy. I mean, she's an Amazon. She has one breast exposed. She's leaning onto a mo motorcycle. She has a defiant look in her face, and she's... She's cool and she's tough. Much of her work had been seen everywhere and was well publicized. And I told her, I want something that hasn't been seen before. How would you like to try something new like installation art? She 
came up with the idea of a sort of a desert bar with sort of souls looking for other souls, etc. I decided to create a gay bar and it's called Sirens. Come on in. These are all uh, women that I feel exist in a women's bar, a lesbian bar. Um, you have the, the butch, the soldier perhaps, the, the femme, the girly girl, the woman with the broken heart. I have a figure on the wall here called the Red Hot Mama. So here's the uh, obligatory pool table. I love playing pool and uh, every, uh, every gay bar has one and needs one. Girly girl, she's uh, dancing, legs are animated, and uh, her breasts are made out of uh, Cadillac taillights, and she's on overdrive. It was a, uh, a really interesting project for me to do this because I had to imagine all of these characters, these figures that are stereotypes and archetypes, people that are friends of mine and, and myself. Homosexuality is certainly a part of it, but not all of it. Um, I'm glad that it is there and I, we have no issues of censorship whatsoever on any of this. She's very comfortable talking about her friends, of her past loves, of which there's a whole gallery devoted to uh, portraits of her past loves. There's, not, there's no uh, hesitancy or reserve or need to qualify, nor do I feel one. Lakish makes a comment on homophobia in her art. Feet on the floor that say, stand in my shoes. When you uh, appear on the monitor, you become part of this litany of uh, derogatory. Gay, fag, dyke, fruit, fairy, lesbo, homo, queer, lesie, nelly, pansy, fag, fag, I come from a military background and I um, mean it was always uh, considered that if you were a woman in the in the military you were automatically a dyke, a queer, a lesbian, a bull dagger, all of that and so uh, this particular figure you know represents that for me and of course Bill Clinton's policy that uh, that you were supposed to don't ask and don't tell has done more damage to individual uh, soldiers in the military than, than anything that ever came before. There's been much more discrimination. Prejudices of our society, I know that's caused pain and struggle in, in Lily's life, but that she uses it to make her stronger. The more open you are and the more honest you are about your own self, your own emotions, your own, um, you know, things that you've gone through, the hurts that you've, that you, that you've suffered and, and what you've made out of it. I mean, it just connects with people, not just gay people, just, you know, straight people with anybody in general. Lily also draws her painful experiences of obsessive love in neon. This is called Love in Vain, and I built this piece in 1977. I did the drawing in 1969. I had to build up the courage, get the money together, and, uh, and then build the 12-foot monument. I had been in love with a woman, an unrequited love affair, as it were. I was uh, interested in creating a large uh, portrait of utter despair, resulting from uh, obsession. It is of a woman who has become the chair in which she's sitting. There's a vacuum cleaner, there's a picture on the wall, and there's flames coming out of her head. It's the utter immobility that results from the destruction of a love affair. For me, being an artist is a process of uh, catharsis. I do a lot of work that is the result of uh, relationships I have with women. And each love affair, when it ends, I have to sort of create something that uh, allows it to live on. If there were no neon sculpture, it, there would be nothing for me. And it's also an exorcism. It is a way of releasing the emotions or the negative, the negative energies that cause me to feel despair, unhappiness, loneliness, all of that. Once I've created a work of art, I've separated myself from it. I can put it on the wall. 
I can look at it, I can walk around it, and it can always be there. I can always relate to it and refer to it, but it's no longer eating away at me. In 1989, Lily created a tribute to the victims of AIDS called For All the Young Men Dying. I've had a lot of uh, friends die from uh, the disease. I think it's uh, something that has uh, meant a lot to me. I've, I've created about um, 10 to 12 different works in this particular series. The first one has an amethyst geode, which uh, reminded me of a um, stigmata or a scar or a wound. Um, the second one, uh, Sacred Heart, has a uh, 1959 Cadillac taillight, uh, which is the um, Sacred Heart as in uh, the Catholic iconography, Burning Heart. And this particular one here is, uh, has a buffalo skull and is called Flesh and Blood So Cheap. So it uh, has a sperm on the left and uh, refers to the uh, birth of life and the death of life. There's a sunset uh, aura around it that uh, again refers to uh, sunset of one's life. Brian Curry, a neon tube bender, is Lily's lifeline to her neon expressions. I'm fascinated by the work that she does do. It's, it's the most incredible, exciting uh, jobs that I've ever worked on. And I've been doing this for 25, 26 years now. And some of her pieces I really get excited working with. You know, every, every piece tells a story. And those stories, the more you look at them, the more deeper the story gets. And every, every time I see the same piece over again, I get a little bit more out of it. She's really a true artist. Because of the costly materials involved, Lackish has little room for mistakes. <laughs> but sometimes, mistakes can lead to new sculptures. This piece is called Steely for Unknown. This is one of the only pieces that I've ever made that is made out of um, scrap neon tubes, tubes that were left over from other works. The uh, Death Angel is, up at the top is actually tubes that had been made for Blessed Oblivion before, but the colors didn't work on Blessed Oblivion, and so I had to change the colors, and they were just left over. Here in her downtown loft in the Artists' District of Los Angeles, with room enough for an indoor tennis court, Lily saws, bolts, and wires her neon sculptures. It looks like something in between a construction job and an electrical engineering job, but nevertheless, it's called fine art. Even though she sometimes uses junk she finds in strange places. That's my uh, greatest pleasure, just wander the streets, love to go to the antique auto swap meet and just spend miles and miles and hours and hours just looking at stuff, detritus, junk, you know, crap, really. And there's just lots of it. And, um, you know, your mind contains this little sieve of, of whatever it is you're, whatever it is I'm, I'm working on. You know, what kind of remains in the sieve I, I look at and, you know, I bring it back to my studio and that's the stuff that I incorporate. A lot of her work is inspired by images from her childhood. Her father was a Yugoslav emigrant who had been captured by the Nazis. But he managed to escape to the U.S. where he became a high-ranking officer in the U.S. Army. My father was in the um, Army military intelligence and uh, we always lived in any one place for two years or three years at the most. We were always traveling from one location to the next. And, we would travel at night a lot and uh, stay in motels and we would have to uh, pick the motel and I would, like, I would get to pick the motel based on which one had the best neon sign. So uh, early on that was uh, a big love of mine, looking at the wonderful imagery on neon signs, cowboys lassoing uh, cattle or Indians shooting bow, bows and arrows. It seemed like all the neon signs told a story pictorially with, with, with animation. And uh, then we were uh, transferred to Germany. And um, 
there wasn't a lot of uh, light and, and, and neon and all. It was, um, it was dark. I remembered that. Even though her father was a military man, arts and crafts was his great passion. Early on, Lily was painting, drawing pictures, and using her hands. I think I knew I was going to be an artist from when I was very, very little. Uh, my father was an amateur artist, and he was uh, the kind of person that always needed somebody next to him to hand him a brush or hand him you know, the tube of paint or hand him the hammer, hand him the nails. I mean, he never could do anything totally by himself. He always wanted a little assistant, and I was, I was his little assistant. Like any child, Lily felt drawn to images that were simple and figurative, but they stuck with her. When I was a kid, most, most kids were collecting baseball cards or uh, Barbie dolls or other things. Uh, we were collecting army patches, and the army patches had wonderful imagery, panthers, you know, tanks, uh, firing flames, all kinds of um, incredible graphic imagery. Later on, she incorporates her childhood images in her art. For example, in this neon sculpture called Blessed Oblivion. It's my tombstone. It's in the shape of a tombstone. It has a death angel up at the top, it has its cross and the uh, dead flowers. The central image is uh, a panther in a death struggle with a python. I related this to actually a struggle with another individual, another person. You know, I was the panther, they were the snake, the endless uh, conflict. Each is uh, powerful in their own way. She prepares for her huge neon sculptures by making numerous drawings. Well, for me, drawing is a very sensuous process because you're stroking this piece of paper with colored pencil and you're making something that is revealed um, sort of slowly. And I always think that when the lips are ready to be kissed, the drawing is done. Long before her big neon sculptures, in 1962, at age 18, Lily Lakish started college at the Pratt Institute in Brooklyn, New York. But art school was a disappointment. I didn't like the, uh, the things that were being taught in, in, in art school. And the only thing I liked doing was, was draw. I just loved drawing, and so I would just draw from one class to the next, uh, subsequently failed painting, and, uh, and I thought, well, maybe being an artist isn't for me, maybe I'll go to film school. After a year, she went back to Pratt Institute in New York, even though she found little understanding for her love of neon. I decided to try to learn how to incorporate neon into my work. So I went to a uh, local sign company and asked them if, if they would teach me. They said, no, <laughs> you can't learn this. Um, so that was disappointing. But there was one man there at the sign company that kind of took me aside, and he gave me a couple of scrap neon tubes, had a little heart, and I used those in, in my very first work. In 1968, Lily moved to San Francisco, hoping to find a venue for her neon obsession. I got a job in a sign company designing neon signs. Well, I found out that they don't really design neon signs in a sign company. What they do is they make a beautiful watercolor painting of the client's building, and then in five minutes you were supposed to put some lettering on the building, and then they'd have this crappy sign. So that was a great, uh, great disappointment. I um, came to Los Angeles and, uh, and loved it. You know, lights, plastic. <laughs> lots of, lots of visual clutter. In Los Angeles, Lily designed posters for the entertainment industry and storefronts and neon sculptures for businesses to support her neon art. In 
1981, Lily founded Mona, the Museum of Neon Art, in her downtown loft to show people that neon is indeed an art form worthy of recognition. She taught classes in neon art and hosted parties, performances, and neon exhibitions. The museum, symbolized by her neon sculpture of Mona Lisa, has finally gotten its own home on Hope Street and Olympic in Los Angeles. Lily has now become a front runner in her field of neon art. She's exhibited in major museums in Los Angeles, New York, San Francisco, Tokyo, and in Europe. Her works hang on the walls of private homes or decorate the walls of some of the largest corporations in America. Some pieces sell for $24,000 and up, and art historians are now paying serious attention to her neon tubes and shapes. There's much more than just that superficial lure of bright colors. There is much more substance to these things uh, as you begin to peruse what they are, the icons, their, their references, art historical and pop icons, Yavlinsky paintings, uh, Vega signs, all of these things come, kind of come together. One of my favorite is Stella for the Unknown, in which she draws from pre-Columbian graves of Mexico to a, a sculpture she had seen in Beijing Square in China, uh, to the Boston uh, Charleston uh, grave carver of uh, colonial America. I mean, it's, it's this amazing, amazing range of, uh, of resources for this. As a symbol of recognition from the art world, Lily was commissioned to do a huge neon piece called L.A. Angel on the exterior wall of the Los Angeles Museum of Contemporary Art. Now, the fine art world had come to her, indicating that talent and will sometimes can change conventional thinking. By being true to herself and her art, Lily is finally being recognized as a fine artist. Being a lesbian has definitely um, influenced my, um, my body of work, and uh, it's something that has only um, added to uh, my sense of uh, self-worth. You can't really be free as an artist unless you're free as a person and your work only uh, speaks to more and more people the more open it is because that's something that connects with everyone and with their, with their common humanity. Lily is continuing to light up the sky with crackling neon. Her latest plan is to install her gay bar in a semi and drive it across the country, stopping in small towns along the way. After all, her sculptures are meant to be seen. When I was in college in art school in New York, it was during the time of Bob Dylan singing in Greenwich Village, and uh, one of his songs was, she's got everything she needs, she's an artist, she don't look back. She can take the dark out of the nighttime and paint the daytime black. And somehow I felt that, that those words spoke directly to me, that I've taken this movement of neon. I have made it take the dark out of the nighttime.